good morning to you, Reinhold, um, and also to our viewers. I have with me Reinhold Heil, a German-born musician, film and television composer, as well as performer. Um, we are both German, but as this interview is supposed to be for an international audience, we decided to do it in English. Um, Reinhold, first of all, thank you for taking time to answer our questions and uh, finding more about you. Um, I'm very glad that we could make this work, um, even though we are on opposite sides of, of the globe. Um, me at the Waldorf office in Remagen, Germany, and you at Hawaii. And we have a fairly big time difference. Um, yeah. Now, <clears throat> my first question is, um, what led you to create music in the first place? I did read somewhere in the internet, uh, not confirmed, um, that you grew up near a monastery. Um, and that's where you were introduced to classical music and also played church organ at a young age. Um, is that how it all started for you? It's part of it. But the other part, and I think in our context, maybe a little bit more uh, interesting, is that my dad had a store with everything electrical. That included mm -hmm. TVs, washing machines, whatever. Yeah. And, uh, and I helped him out. So as, even at a, the tender age of maybe 11, 12, 13, I was often in that shop. And of course, in Germany, shops are closed. It's a small town, right? The, yeah. the monastery is like literally behind our house. Mm -hmm. It's a thousand year old building mm -hmm. that was, you know, and, but, you know, I, I was raised Catholic, but I, the monastery was was not part of, mm -hmm. you know, my life, really. Okay. There was, there was a high school in the monastery That was not run by the church. It was a, a state high school. So that monastery was no longer an actual monastery, mm -hmm. although the building was a thousand years old. And I did go to that high school. I did mm -hmm. my, my A-levels yeah. in that, uh, in, in that okay. monastery. So I had the shortest school trip uh, of all of my schoolmates. Um, but my, my dad had that shop. And so I would sometimes sit Saturday afternoons or Sundays in that shop and And I would find things like a, a brown, uh, uh, prof not, not professional, but, but a pretty advanced tape recorder. And then I would have a little microphone mm -hmm. and I would record. And then that, it, it was possible to do sound on sound to, mm -hmm. and, and to do feedback. So I, I um, just happened to come across these things without reading any theory, without any, having anybody... Uh, teach me which would have been great actually if i would have been in a big city and i could have gone to places where people would have introduced me or actually taught me earlier in my life so i had to kind of discover everything myself but there was this fascination with what you could do with sound and with sound recorders and with machines that would manip manipulate sound mm -hmm. and that was just bigger than anything else you know bigger than sports and so on and so on And uh, well, bigger than, than school, you know, like doing the homework. And uh, I did have um, piano lessons. Um, they weren't very great. And so I asked my music teacher, who was a great musician, and my music teacher in that high school, who happened to also be a cantor at the Catholic Church, and he kind of pushed me. He, I think he manipulated me into learning organ. So mm -hmm. I learned church or organ for about, you know, like pipe organ for mm -hmm. about five years. I did play the piano, I, I had a Hammond organ, and I started playing in a band at the same time. So all of this commingles yeah. into, you know, and, and I'm sure I never really practiced enough, you know, in terms of, the, I, I don't have much discipline, mm -hmm. so I'm totally driven just by my interest. Yeah. Whatever interests me, I will spend days with, and if I can't make money with that, it doesn't matter. It, that's that's a very sad condition. You It's know, a that's drive. I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not driven yeah. by the, the money aspect mm -hmm. of the business, but I'm actually just driven by the thing itself, mm -hmm. by making the music and exploring yeah. sounds and stuff like that. And you were in Which charge was, of picking the records, right, at the store? That's correct. Yeah. <laughs> I was also I was also doing the the purchasing mm -hmm. of the of the records, and <clears throat> and the thing was that uh, that. Uh, When I liked a record, uh, my, my dad didn't really look at what I did exactly, but if, if one of my favorite records sold out, I ordered one more copy, and then when the, that copy didn't sell anymore, I, I could keep it. And that was, my, that was also my payment for my work. 
right? Mm -hmm. So and I didn't exploit it, but this is how my, my vinyl record collection started, mm -hmm. basically with these, you know, so I, I was listening to the Beatles, the Stones, and then more and more to, to jazz influences. Um, and, and of course, the big prog rock bands with all the Hammond organs and the synthesizers. And of course, synthesizers were like an early, early dream. And so when I finally um, just barely passed the entrance exam in the um, University of the Arts back in, in the Berlin? day, it was in Berlin, mm -hmm. um, I, I had a, you know, I had my little Hammond organ there and I realized that I needed to change my instruments. So I, I bought a Fender Rhodes and then I bought a Mini Moog, all with all this money that I made by working in my dad's shop mm -hmm. and with his support also. Mm -hmm. Uh, so I started this uh, playing in this in, in, in Berlin clubs with this kind of uh, electric jazz uh, think um, Miles Davis bitches brew that album from the mm -hmm. late 60s that then kind of triggered all this sort of experimentation with Herbie Hancock and Chick Corea and mm -hmm. uh, weather report Mahavishnu Orchestra Jan Hammer you know on, on synthesizer so these were the big big influences mm -hmm. at the time and then in 1977 or 1976, I met this guy, this guitar player, who came back to me and a year later and said, I met this woman from East Germany. She, she was just ousted. She's an artist. She's a singer. She's really great. And she has a record deal with CBS Records. And she's now in West Berlin. She's looking for a band. Mm. Don't you want to join? And I said, no, I'm still in university. I want to graduate. You know, I was like, actually, as much as I was not money driven, I thought I had to do this degree first mm -hmm. um, for security and maybe also for my dad's sake, because he was, you know, he was paying for it all. He mm -hmm. was, I, I was and on supporting his, you with your decisions. Me, yeah. Right? So you're like, I, I want to be able to to show him something that he supported. And I did. I actually mm -hmm. gave him the diploma. They said, I don't need it because by that time we were already successful yeah. with the Nina yeah. Hamann. So like at my last two years in university were kind of crazy because um, I was in the in the university and at the rehearsal mm -hmm. room at, you know, uh, several times, sometimes changing several times a day. Mm -hmm. There was a lot of driving through Berlin. Wow, okay. <laughs> uh, and uh, when and how did you first start to work with uh, Waldorf synthesizers? Um, that was, well, actually, I think I, I, I should start slightly earlier, and that is with PPG. So, you know, if you look at the big uh, synthesizer um, innovators, so you have Bob Moog, you know, it was New York, the East Coast, this, this is the East Coast uh, subtractive synthesis that he, and then you have Buchla on the West Coast with more, you know, interesting waveform manipulations and stuff like that. And the person who they don't talk about very much is Wolfgang Palm from Hamburg, who gave us wavetable synthesis. Mm -hmm. He invented that. And he, I really think, was just as much as a vis visionary as Bob Moog was, mm -hmm. or is. I think he's still around. He's still alive. Let's not kill him now. He's absolutely wonderful guy. And I had his, uh, I had all, not all of his synthesizers, but I had, of course, the famous PPG Wave mm -hmm. 2.2. And then I had the 2.3 with the Wave Term. And I loved experimenting with it, but it also kind of killed me because the the amount of time that you needed to to actually get to these really, really interesting and very awesome results was was just it was just too much then you know then i switched to a uh, a fair light and that was the same kind of thing it was it, you know it, it's great but it's it really it really limits you at the time you know in the early 80s memory was was scarce um it, all that stuff was not particularly uh easy to 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 use and so i i, mean, I ended up like selling most of my stuff and then always for the new thing, right? Mm -hmm. And always to make it smaller. And this is where Waldorf comes in. Then Waldorf came out with uh, the microwave, which was basically a PPG in a rack format. And little did I know that, of course, it had e it was even a little bit more complicated to operate because it only had that one big knob. And the sound was amazing. So, I mean, I absolutely loved the microwave and 
it it was one of the the bunch of synthesizers mm -hmm. that I still had as hardware synthesizers, mm -hmm. and then in the '90s I kind of I really kind of drifted out of the whole hardware synthesizer uh, world, and uh, went into plugins and to creative sampling. This was this was sort of where I spent most most of my time. Apart from the fact that I had also then started making uh, film music, so. I wasn't. I didn't have as much time to actually really experiment with uh, with everything uh, uh, as much as I did before. Mm -hmm. So I was kind of creating all these my my personal sampler libraries that I could use in the films, and synthesizers were just you know just a tool that I needed mm -hmm. to kind of get on and not not spend so much time with them uh, privately, so to speak. You know, like it always used to be in. in you know, in the time before when I wasn't a film composer yet, a new synthesizer came and there were two weeks just with that thing to, to really to really understand it. So fast forward like several decades, and sure, I had all kinds of machines. And of course, I saw the Waldorf Wave, but it was way too big for my studio. It was potentially too expensive for me. So I, I skipped a whole bunch of generations of Waldorf syn uh, synthesizers. And then the Quantum came and it was kind of the perfect way, the perfect machine to come back to hardware synthesizers because it just rolled everything in there. You know, there are people who say, well, I want to have an old PPG Wave 2.2 2 and I'm like, you don't have to. It will cost you, you know, 15 grand to buy this old machine and it will do a fraction of what this yeah. machine does. This is just one of the mm -hmm. many, many aspects that you, that you can uh, work on with the quantum or the iridium, you know, so like this new generation of, of the uh, world of synthesizers. So, and creative sampling is coming into it and granular synthesis comes into it. And there's a really good uh, virtual analog component that I don't think is the most important aspect of it, but just the, the, the sheer power that that is at your fingertips with that one machine is just mm -hmm. absolutely uh, breathtaking. Yeah. And it's just beautiful. To work with and uh Thank so you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah so and, i i am very excited and i i do things i i love working in surround and i in kind of a, a surround that has nothing to do with microphones but uh the quantum has uh two stereo outputs so i i work it in quad you know i mm -hmm. use layering and i i experiment with you know different kinds of sounds in the front and the rear output and um, and that's just gotten another boost with the new software update because uh, we have to we have to mention Rolf Wermann, who is the guy who created the software for yes. for the for the quantum, because he too is one of those those people who give us you know who just pushes a step forward mm -hmm. in terms of you know uh, giving us the tools that that we really want, um, and and so he just worked really really hard i think for easily a year to do this new upgrade where mm -hmm. the quantum when you take the analog filters out is a 16 voice synthesizer just like the like the iridium and now i have basically an eight voice coming out of four channels and so that's that's that was like the last bit that was missing there and the other thing is that uh, you know there is of course one thing that you get that you get uh, spoiled by that is um, with the software, and that is that you work really quick, really quickly with samples, like getting samples in and getting them mapped. That's not as fast on the quantum, although it's faster than on any hardware machine that mm -hmm. I know. Um, I still like the fact that I can now use a software to actually import all kinds of previous existing uh, multi samples and then just shoot them into in, into the quantum, mm -hmm. and that is with a software that just was updated uh, wow. to yeah. be able to do that. And that was a uh, sample robot. Yeah. So I just got sample robot. I haven't really gotten super deep into it, but that's kind of, you know, the, the 16 voice polyphony and having sample robot to, to do the mappings, at least the raw mappings in the machine, in, in the, in the soft uh, software mm -hmm. and then shooting it in the quantum and then dealing with the, just with the sound possibilities of the quantum. Mm -hmm. in the machine yeah. in the in the in the actual keyboard
Ja, wow, okay, thank you. Um, Reinhold, is there a Waldorf sound of audio you have created that will always stick with you? Um, yeah, I mean, there's, I think I'm not the only one who likes a particular wavetable mm -hmm. that sounds particularly aggressive. <laughs> And, uh, you know, I think it still even comes from the old PPG, and I like that one a lot. I have done a bunch of, of patches that, that use that particular wavetable 13. It used to be the wavetable 13. <laughs> And now, of course, you have endless numbers of wavetables available. Yeah. Um, that would be one thing going back some time but there's another thing that I did I think about two years ago um, I started experimenting with with the modulation matrix of the of the quantum and the quantum has a whole bunch I think it has six LFOs and they can all be synchronized that's another absolutely amazing thing about the, uh, the the quantum is that everything in that machine including the wavetables sequences that go the way the sound goes through the wavetable can be perfectly synced uh, to to your um, to your beats per minute of your of your piece and uh, <clears throat> and the LFOs too so there with so many LFOs you can you can modulate the speed of one with the other and it becomes absolutely endless it you you move into a territory with a with a keyboard synthesizer uh, you move into territory of territory of very very complex modular mm -hmm. synthesizer patches you know stuff that you wouldn't expect from a keyboard mm -hmm. but the cool thing is you still have a keyboard as a keyboarder you can still trigger them in your traditional way but but what you're actually triggering is something that is extremely complex and it has uh Yeah, it's it's very hard to describe. I have I have a video on my YouTube channel that uh, that shows that very patch. Mm -hmm. It's and and the piece, which is basically the patch, creates a piece. You know, you just hit a few notes. There's nothing much to perform because the patch itself is the composition. Mm -hmm. And you know, I I I called it "Ode to Karl Heinz," in uh, you know, in remembrance of Karl Heinz Stockhausen, just because I thought. Uh, Karl Heinz Stockhausen would just would have just loved the quantum because <laughs> it would have made his life a lot easier <laughs> when you know how how they did the experimental and groundbreaking electronic music yeah. in in uh, back in the 50s you know ah okay uh, um, <laughs> Reinhold how is your Waldorf synthesizer uh, how are your Waldorf synthesizer incorporated into your uh, setup? Well, at this point, because I'm at my very reduced studio on this flower farm, <laughs> the Waldorf is actually the Quantum is my is my master keyboard. Oh. I will probably change it because I want an 88 note, but um, I'm not totally sure. Uh, uh, I think it's going to sit at the right angle uh, on my workstation. And uh, as I said, the, the the four outputs are are connected to to logic inputs mm -hmm. and the, the, the main output is yeah. in the front yeah. uh, channels and yeah. the aux output is in the rear channels and um, it's all set up in a way that it's easy to record it because I, I think that uh, any piece of hardware I like to actually make recordings of it mm -hmm. despite the fact that the quantum can do everything perfectly live and that the sync situation is re really really good um, so uh, the, the, the only sort of drawback that some film composers are saying is like, oh, I can't just hit uh, bounce and then do an offline bounce of that, of, of that quantum track. And I always think, well, you know, uh, you, get, you get all this, you capture it, you can have it reproduced mm -hmm. millions of times, but I basically have it set up in my template so that MIDI goes out to the quantum I can always hear it through those two outputs the way I would end up recording it. And once I'm done with the part, I record it mm. onto those, okay. you know, two stereo tracks, basically. And then I can can manipulate it further. But usually I, I, I wait until the piece is done and then I until at least that part mm -hmm. of the quantum is done and okay. then I record it.
So I have, I have audio snippets, yeah. kind of like you would do it with, with a, a modular synthesizer. I don't think you would have a modular synthesizer running live in the background yeah. and then only use it at the final bounce, you know? Mm -hmm. Nobody would, I don't mm -hmm. think anybody would do that. Okay, so, so you're now waiting for your new studio to be ready next month. Yeah. No, Very well, exciting. Yeah. Well, it's actually, <laughs> yeah, the studio will, should be ready in about four weeks, mm -hmm. I hope. Yeah. Knock on wood. But, um, and I will integrate the Iridium as well. And maybe I'm even going to do a thing where I have six channels playing simultaneously. And they're not all playing, ex they're playing the same notes, but they're playing different timbres and different, mm -hmm. you know, different aspects of the sound. And then you can, you can send, you basically have six outputs. You have four from the Quantum, mm -hmm. you have one from the Iridium. So you can have one in the front, one in the middle and one in the rear or whatever you know so basically uh, expand the the spaciousness of of the quantum and i know that most people don't have a dolby atmos system at home but apple music and other streaming services are actually you know um, offering immersive audio with headphones mm -hmm. Personally, I recommend buying a soundbar that has Atmos, and I really, really hope that this takes off and that that this kind of immersive music will will become the standard. I know it's it's a little bit more problematic for your average customer to have to have this, but these soundbars are no longer that expensive, and I just yeah. bought one of them for my for my new living room. So I have my nice. Atmos mm. professional yeah. monitoring in the studio, and the next door I have my living room. And I have this simple Samsung, it's not simple, it's short. it does cost like $1,200, $1,500 or so. But I have an Atmos soundbar where nice, I watch yeah. television and mm -hmm. I can watch movies because I'm on an island far away from Los Angeles. All the art house cinemas are uh, out of my life, basically. Mm -hmm. I have to fly five hours to get to them. And we have two, we have to just two or three mainstream, you know, movie houses. So I bought a really, really big screen TV and the Atmos soundbar. <laughs> and I am definitely pretty much hell bent. Again, no matter how much money I make with this, I'm pretty much hell bent to do, to produce music in, in Atmos and try to convince the people to, to consume the music mm -hmm. like that. And you know? what are you working on at the moment? What is your project? Well, it's, it's, well, I'm in, in transition. So like, I couldn't possibly have taken a, yeah. a film scoring uh, project mm -hmm. at this time. Waiting for uh, your studio to be because ready. Because I also yeah. don't have, yeah. you know, I don't have a massive studio with, with lots of mm -hmm. assistants anymore. I'm actually down to a one more, a one person uh, operation. So mm -hmm. in other words, I'm, I'm just working on uh, on various albums simultaneously. I just put out one and uh, just on Bandcamp and I will put it on the streaming services and it's an ambient album. Um, and uh, it's it's kind of the softest music I've ever made. Uh, it's almost like if you listen to the whole 50 minutes and you're not sleeping at the end, then <laughs> I failed. <laughs> It's kind of more interesting at the beginning and at the end it's just it's just atmospheres. I will definitely listen to that. <laughs> yeah, I will say, I will send it to you. Um, Thanks. Yeah, that's that's going to be, it's and I'm and I'm doing it under the moniker Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. Yeah, I, I heard which, about that. Which is why, you know, it's it's because it's always good to collaborate with somebody mm -hmm. even if that somebody isn't a real person, it's just another personality of yours. I think I do have a little bit of multiple personality disorder, not in the really pathological way, but in musically speaking, mm -hmm. I actually do. Yeah. So, and that's why I'm, 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 you know, that's why it's kind of, that's the name of the project, uh, because it just shows, you know, that I have an inner dialogue, so to speak, or sometimes I have a phase where I focus on something and then the next day I come and be like, what the hell is this? And then I have to basically have mm -hmm. my, my dialogue with what I did the day before. Mm -hmm. And I think that's not unlike what other composers do. Um, but yeah, so and, and the album's called Ambient Work Softness, Ambient Works. And there will be more Ambient Works albums coming. Mm -hmm. So there's going to be a Darkness album, 
there's going to be action pieces. It's it's kind of like doing a music library, but I'm not doing a music library. I'm doing I'm doing a bunch of instrumental mm -hmm. solo albums. Looking forward uh, to it. I always have. I also have. I don't know. I think easily 20 songs, two albums worth of songs again, which I haven't worked on in 30 years, 25 years. I haven't done any songs. So the last three years, uh, when I was still in Los Angeles and while I was here, I wrote a whole bunch of lyrics in German and in English, and I recorded them and I sang again. And I'm not totally sure if I'm, if I'm courageous enough to put them out, but I hope I, I am. Because <laughs> mm -hmm. that's, you know, when you sing, when you when you make statements and forms of lyrics, it's it's a, you become much more vulnerable than if you put out instrumental music. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of a it's a thing for people with very high self confidence and more outgoing personality than than what I have. I'm actually really quite an introvert. I'm not sure if I can believe that. <laughs> After my waterfall of talking, that's, that's the thing with the introverts, you know, like I'm a functioning introvert and I'm also an ADD person. So untreated uh, attention deficit disorder, depression, you name it. I've, I've, I've had all of these things and I haven't taken any pills for them because it was never bad enough to to make me dysfunctional mm -hmm. in a way that I couldn't meet my deadlines for the mm -hmm. film scoring, for instance. And um, I also think that sometimes, you know, your emotional turmoil it can be a creative trigger, mm -hmm. right? So you can... Absolutely. You will, yeah. yeah, I think if so, too. If you listen to my music, you will, there, there's a lot of melancholy mm -hmm. in there, and it's not coming from... It's not, that's not random, and it's, it, it's definitely coming from deep inside. Yeah. You know, the creative spark is always something you cannot explain. Yeah. There's something happening to you rather than you are making something happening. Yeah, there's a deepness so, yes. you otherwise won't experience as much, maybe. That's right. So yeah. trying to, to kill that with pills, I mean, I know that there are people who have heavy-duty de depression mm -hmm. and, and have thoughts of, of suicide. I really do think that's a different situation. I never had mm -hmm. a, a, I never, in, even in the deepest depressions that I had, I, I never needed to, or I even had the thought of ending my life. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it couldn't have been that bad, mm -hmm. but it's still, so you know. So you, you also kind of turned your, the dark side of the soul into something creative and yes. the music is like an outlet for you to deal and with your healing. inside yeah. and your feelings right that's right it's absolutely healing mm -hmm. to have that outlet and to channel the, the those energies uh, they're not necessarily bad energies i mean the, the world isn't perfect actually yes. quite perfect here yeah i was about to say hawaii is pretty much close to it's, perfection yeah. right yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it is but it's <laughs> the weather is is close to perfect you know it, yeah it, it rains a lot up here especially up here in i mean the cloud forest you know they have these uh, uh coffee mm -hmm. farms yeah uh, me. uh and i will be a further down the hill but i will still see the pacific ocean that's yeah uh, that's my favorite bo body of water and uh, that's also and so healing right i mean living I in germany so. where it's dark l many months of the year and the weather can be pretty depressing especially in the winter time and people who are um like who already have difficulty struggling with depression or you know whatever um, tend to feel even worse when it's, yep. you know, it's a dark season. So right. living in Hawaii probably helps you stay sure. more happy, I assume. Yeah. I was in Santa Barbara. I didn't have an ocean view there. I, I then moved to Los Angeles and I moved to downtown and was in a loft and that was all super cool and it's the arts district and there's lot, lots of cool stuff going on. But, um, you know, I didn't have a view. My view was a big cactus, which was better than nothing, in, in the backyard <laughs> of that loft building. And that was going on for four years. And then I moved uh, to, the, to the San Fernando Valley for four years, and it was extremely hot. You couldn't go mm -hmm. outside, and you had to, had to run the air conditioning and everything. It was quite cool to live there, to be honest. 
But I think Los Angeles, you know, has very, very beautiful spots. If you live in Malibu or in Pacific Palisades or in Topanga Canyon, um, it, it's very, very cool to be in Los Angeles because you're also just yeah, about an hour away from where, you know, cool things are happening, yeah. museums and stuff like that. So I totally love all, the, I actually love all the places where I've lived before. I never left the place behind in anger and mm -hmm. looking back and like, oh, that was really shit. Well, maybe my personal, you know, living quarters weren't the best. Mm -hmm. But, um, but you know, it, it kind of, you know, I always dreamt of a place where I could be on a little bit of a higher spot looking at the ocean mm -hmm. and I could just not afford it in Los Angeles because yeah. these places cost millions and millions yeah. and millions. So you just so, moved recently, right? I moved at the beginning of the pandemic when mm -hmm. the when the real estate prices went up and I was able to sell my house in Los Angeles, which I didn't think I I would do. And I just, you know, sometimes I I've I've made these kind of more courageous jumps, you mm -hmm. know, where you just go, Okay, there's an opportunity, maybe I should go for it. And it could be it could end up in disaster, but if it works out the way I think it should, then Yeah. And this is this is one of them, you know. I've I've been a lot less daring or courageous. Like, okay, there's a courageous move to move from Berlin to California, when you're somewhat of an established artist and you have to start over again. Yeah, so I've I've been doing that kind of stuff before, but but with the real estate and with all the money that's involved, and you know, you have to have a studio mm. and then. And that's why I ended up uh, decide I, I bought a piece of land and I built the house, mm -hmm. so that the structure of the house is just built to my needs, and uh, the studio is a big part of that, mm -hmm. of course. Yeah. Wow. Okay. Thank you, Reinhold. We have already taken up so much of your time. <laughs> Thank you again. Um, is there anything I'm else you sorry. want to share? Yeah, well, I, I think, you know, you might want to focus on all the stuff that I that I said about the quantum, maybe not so much the the, the, the all the before stuff, but um, I'm I'm definitely excited to finally put those machines to work in a way, um, you know, the way they should be like easily accessible, everything mm -hmm. is wired yeah. up perfectly, you know, that's, it, it's a little bit limited where I am right now. Um, and I'm also looking forward to what else is going to happen, because apparently, you know, development doesn't stand still, more stuff is happening. Yeah. I think Rolf is sitting um, by the fireside, I think he's busy. He is very busy, yes. <laughs> and everybody at Waldorf is very busy. So um, that's cool. Can't wait to see what else is coming. Thank you so, so much, Reinhold. I enjoyed this interview a lot. And I hope yeah. that someday in the future, um, when you are in your new studio and everything is set up, maybe we can do this again. <laughs> Thank yeah, you so let's much. Do it again. Let's scrap this part. You know, it's only a flower farm. <laughs> it's beautiful. <laughs> I saw the view. You showed planet. me the view before the interview started. <laughs> yeah, it's okay. nice. Good. Thank you so, so much. You're welcome. Thank you. Bye-bye.